The second area I talked about, structure. This is an area of huge concern in schools across the country and among pediatricians and, and psychologists and others because we have um, so many children these days who are well-loved but who are being raised in situations that I think of as understructured. That is, places where sentences like, no, you can't, or yes, you must, appear to be very rare events and for the child, completely novel experiences. We have many more kids who come to school now who are really good kids, but for whom uh, this is an unusual thing when the school is open. If you sat in a really good third grade all over the country, I've done it. You watch the teacher say something like this. Okay, uh, put away your reading books and uh, take out the math. And instead of the old 90 second shuffle, we now have the three to four minute window while various kids negotiate about whether they really want to do this or not because they're used to negotiating all the time. Now the way authority typically has worked in many cultures has been that it starts out adult authority is unilateral and becomes more negotiated as the kids get older. So, um, I had this vivid experience of it years ago that I've never stopped talking about. I had taught high school and then I taught preschool while I was getting a degree in psychology. And at the end of my uh, psychology postdoctoral training, I was taking a seminar that met in the evenings at the home of a very eminent Boston psychologist. He had a big, tall Victorian house. One June evening, I arrive early and I'm walking up to the back door, the screen door where you go in, and I hear some muffled shouting. Turns out that it's his son's up in the third floor of the shop. And then as I reach the door, I hear the famous psychologist's voice down the hall boom out. I'm going to tell you exactly what he said. Because your goddamn father says so, that's why. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm stunned. I thought you got to be a psychologist. You never had to resort to this. That was a stupid idea. But I knew the famous guy would be embarrassed that a rookie had overheard him in an unpsychological moment. <laughs> and I'm debating, do I, you know, do I creep back and pretend I wasn't there to hear or what? He shows up at the door, no trace of embarrassment. He says, hi, come on in. Well, he had two boys who were then 10 and 12. It was a hot June day. They'd been playing outside all day. They were sweaty and dirty. They're fooling around on the third floor. He wanted them to come down. And, and take showers and get into their pajamas so they're ready for bed as soon as his seminar is over. So he called up to get their attention, which I didn't hear, once, twice, three times. No answer. The fourth time he calls up, they yell back, what? Which is what I heard. What? What? He apparently said, come down here. And they yelled back, why? What? So he told them why. <laughs> now, you'd have to know him. He was and still is profane. But he wasn't vicious, he wasn't mad, he wasn't sadistic, he wasn't going to hit them, he wasn't enraged. It was his way of saying, get down here. He had a great relationship with those boys. They're now long grown, and he still does. Um, but he said his piece and it was time to get down here. So I don't care how old your children are. Imagine this. You explain to him why he can't, or to her why she must. <clears throat> Child objects. <clears throat> so you repeat the explanation adding a few details to confirm its logic. Mm -hmm. The child objects. So now you flesh it out in full technicolor, so the rationale and the purity of your logic would be clear to the dumbest creature on God. <laughs> right? And the child objects. So the buzzer ought to go off in your head that says, now if I repeat this again, a fourth time, what are the odds that this child is suddenly going to say, Oh, no. Oh, thank you for persevering. I see that you're right and I'm wrong. I don't know how I could be so short-sighted. I appreciate your, your patience and your generosity, and I'll try not to do this again. Slim and none. A lot of times, all you can say is, I'm sorry I haven't convinced you, but it's my house and my car and my money. And when you're on your own, you can do what you want, but while you're here, we're doing what I want. You don't have to start there never go there. What happens is that your children don't have then what I think of as a containing structure around them, including something under their feet that they can count on. You'll have less friction if you just give in all the time. But they won't have the beginnings or the continuing support for the kind of internalized self-discipline they're going to need in order to be resilient when something important doesn't go their way when they don't get the job they really thought they wanted. 
when they have a boss who doesn't seem to appreciate them in some way, when they have to work out some kind of an important uh, uh, falling out that's happened with a good friend or something like that. And so the investment you have to, in the moment when it happens, you don't say to yourself, ah, oh, this is a teachable moment. You think, oh, right? But it actually is a teachable moment. It actually is. And you don't all have to do it the same way, and you don't all have to do it about the same things. That's actually, there's lots of room. We have a lot of evidence. There's a lot of different ways for, for this to work. What we do know is that the kids need a piece of this kind of structure if they're going to turn out to be resilient as they grow up.